bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this opportunity right at the beginning of the year to spend time in your presence. We thank you that you've promised where one or two are met in your name, there you'll be in the midst. So we're assured you're with us this morning. We want to bring those known to us, family and friends and others too, that have needs this morning. Perhaps they are suffering bereavement or ill health or loss of some kind. We pray, Father, in the way that you love to care for the weak and the downcast, that you'd meet them in their needs this morning. We pray for ourselves as we come. Father, speak to us, we pray. We thank you that you too promise your spirit will help us to understand and help us to apply your word to our hearts and into our lives. We ask that all will be done to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is the last in a series that we've been looking at. Let's make sure I'm turned. That's better. Uh, turning your typical Christmas upside down. Uh, and we're thinking uh, a bit further on in the story of, that, of the early church today. We've focused in this series about the story of the, the baby in Bethlehem. Of how his birth was unexpected by his parents how their lives were radically changed when angels met with them and told them not only were they going to have a miraculous child, but that child was the Son of God. They'd been chosen as parents to to a child that was going to change the world forever. We've spent time thinking about how humble that birth was. That the Son of God, this world changer, was born in a humble place. Not in a place where kings and queens would have been seen. Not in a place of perfume and cleanliness but in a dirty, smelly, despised place. And how thinking about those things and thinking about how different they are from perhaps the images we have in our minds or the Christmas cards that we've sent and the images on those needs to make us think about the radical change that this child brings. the first service of the new year, so I, I wonder how you got on so far. Are you one of the many that have made New Year's resolutions? Did you sit there on New Year's Eve thinking, next year's going to be different. Next year, I'm going to do something different. Lots of people do. Here's the top 30 New Year's resolutions for last year. Read more books. Save more money. Lose weight. (coughs) Spend less time on the TV. I'm not quite sure what 18 means. (laughs) Eat, Eat less chocolate. Drink less alcohol. Quit smoking. People, perhaps you and I, have made such resolutions. We mean to start afresh. We pick the first day of the the year to try and make a change in our lives. There are about all sorts of things about slowing down or speeding up. They're about gaining or losing. They're about starting or, or stopping. You see, we all have a dissatisfaction with our own lives. We all have the feeling that they're not quite what they could be or should be. 
there's something that could be done to make them different. The sad thing is that research has shown that over the last four years, most people have made the same resolution every January the 1st. That they're so dissatisfied in an area of their lives that they've promised themselves they're going to do better. How's your New Year's resolution, if you made one? Is it still going well? Because that same research has shown that about nine days, by about the ninth day, most people have given up. Life-changing promises they make to themselves, on average, last about nine days. And instead of speeding up, they find they're back to their normal pace. Instead of slowing down, they're going just as fast. Instead of losing, they're gaining. Instead of gaining, they're losing. Instead of starting, they've stopped again. And the things they wanted to stop are back again to stay. We often want to make changes in our lives. Some big changes. Some little changes. Some changes that don't just affect us, but we want to affect the world around us. Do you remember this photograph? Some of you are thinking, what? And some of you are thinking, oh, you know. Just before you get smug about remembering it, you'd have to be around in 1965 to remember when this was originally in the newspapers. These were protesters against the Vietnam War. It's a world-famous picture. As the protesters put flowers in the end of gun barrels. Symbolic, of course, of they wanting them to be no more war. For peace to break out. Now, what a flower in the end of a gun barrel does, I'm not quite sure. Did it work? Have we had no more wars since 1965? Were these national guardsmen who'd been sent to corral these protesters? Have they not been out on the streets since then? But you see, change is difficult to make. Because of human nature, we get stuck in ruts and, and tend to do the same things again and again and again. It, it seems to be our, our inert nature. Turning your typical Christmas upside down. I'd like to show you a media clip. If you came to the 7 o'clock carol service, then you would have seen this clip before. I think it's a great clip. If you didn't come, watch carefully. Thank you. We remember the birth of Jesus the Christ. We have been told stories of old. God came as a child to change the destiny of all men, to show forgiveness to sinners. To believe such things is misguided. The truth is, he was just an ordinary man who lived an ordinary life. Those who do not believe the truth say, we proclaim his name, Emmanuel, God with us. We share the wonder of the shepherds. We sing the songs of the angels. This is not what is real. Shepherds were not awakened by angelic announcement. There were no wise men celebrating the birth of the king. I'd be lying to you if I said that for the creator of the universe, there was no room in the inn. For the Son of God, there was but a humble stable. Whether you like it or not, this is the reality of Christmas. That's what I used to think. But then I made room for him in my heart, and Jesus turned it all upside down. This is the reality of Christmas, whether you like it or not. There was but a humble stable for the Son of God. There was no room in the end for the creator of the universe. 
I'd be lying to you if I said that there were no wise men celebrating the birth of the king, that shepherds were not awakened by angelic announcement. This is not what is real. We sing the song of the angels. We share the wonder of the shepherds. We proclaim his name, Emmanuel, God with us. Those who do not believe the truth say he was just an ordinary man who lived an ordinary life, but to believe such things is misguided. The truth is, to show forgiveness to sinners, to change the destiny of all men, God came as a child. We've been told stories of old. We remember the birth of Jesus Christ. very clever but so true if we're not careful we look at things the wrong way round and, and get them wrong sometimes we do need to turn things upside down to make the right sense of them sometimes we need to rethink the things that we've always thought and always done and always been in order to be different You see, we don't want to do what the New Year's resolutions do, which is in, relies upon willpower, or, or, or buying in, spending our money on getting someone to help us make changes. Because we've tried that in the past, and it, it just doesn't work for us, and works for very few. So this new year, we're going, we can try with God's help and support to make life-changing, transforming changes in our own lives and in the lives that affect others. Changes that will ripple out in ever-increasing circles from you and I. So as we end this Christmas time, why don't we change? Why don't we do some turning upside down of our own? You see, that's what the first Christmas was all about. That's why Jesus came. That's entirely what the story is all about. It's about the unexpected. It's about not doing what's always happened. King not being born in a palace. Shepherds being invited before royalty to come and to worship. It's about lives, individual lives, being turned upside down. One of the best known sentences in the Bible goes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The verse suggests, in fact promises, that through no effort on our part, God will give us the free gift of eternal life. If we simply believe, that's surely got to be too good to be true. The verse encourages us to believe that instead of coming with huge regrets, instead of coming, crawling before this powerful God and expect it to pay back for all the wrong things we've done, there's a Heavenly Father who welcomes us in. Who welcomes us in and is so pleased to see us. But not only do we inherit eternal life, not only does he give us that free gift of spending a life with him in eternity, but that he supplies our needs in the current world as well. Now, of course those of us that have been on that walk for some time, those of us that have seen the free gift for what it is and accepted it as a free gift, know that 
when we've experienced God's love in our own hearts, there's something we want to do. There's a desire we have to give a response back for that love that he showers upon us. Two Peter says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him, who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world that is caused by evil desires. That's all that he does for us, because he can't do any more for us. But the writer goes on to say, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there becomes a desire in our hearts to want to serve. There becomes a desire in our hearts to want to know more. There becomes a, 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 a stimulation within us to, to go and to find and to serve and to share. Having written many school reports over many, many years, none of which I've done over the last year, I love the word, words ineffective and unproductive. Those unaware, I taught at an all-boys school in Portsmouth, not the nice ones you pay for, but the ones you get to if you're not quite so good. And those words describe so many of the boys that were before me as I sought to give them knowledge about mathematics. But actually, those words describe much of my life as well. Ineffective and unproductive. It, it's part of human nature again. We, we bottom out. We, we move downwards rather than upwards, left to our own devices. It's again why this time of year people are making promises to themselves about self-improvement. But I don't want us this morning to beat ourselves up. The believers among us, don't beat yourself up if, if you're thinking the same, if you're still thinking that, oh, actually, last year wasn't a good year for my Christian faith. I, I, I need to be reading the Bible more. I, I need to be praying more. I need not to go to those places, but I do need to go to those ones. Because even Paul found he had struggles in his life of faith. Romans 7, 19 says, For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Paul's life was changed upside down. Those of us that, that know how he was on his way to persecute more Christian believers. This is a man with zeal, this is a man with huge intellect. This is a man with all the human gifts you could have. And his mission had become to crush the embryonic church. Not content with just persecuting the church in Jerusalem, he'd asked for particular authority to go around the then known world to persecute the church, to seek them out. And as he's journeying to do just that, God breaks into his heart and his life. And changes him. Uses those qualities that he has, that zeal, that intellect, for the purpose of building the church, not 
crushing and destroying it. And yet Paul says, you know what? I know how much God loves me. I know how much God gives me the power to do the things he wants me to do, and yet I still find myself doing those things I don't want to do and not doing those things that I ought to do. That's the life that we lead. We need to be careful, not damning ourselves or others who are believers because we've we have entered into a spiritual battle. There is resistance and opposition that is all too active and willing to encourage us to return to our old ways. It's not just the human nature thing, the inertia we feel. Nine days after we've made great promises to ourselves, there's that and there's two the realisation we are in a spiritual battle. And just as we give our hearts and lives to serving God who gives us so much so freely, there's an enemy who wants us to be just the same as we always were. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. And of course we are promised the Holy Spirit to strengthen and help us to be what our Heavenly Father has planned for us. You see, each of us has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Each of us. God has given us gifts and abilities and wants us to use them in a particular way. They may look very dormant. There may be glimmers of them seen in our, in our lives, but God wants to use them for his plan and his purpose for us. He wants to turn our lives upside down so that we become givers and not takers sharers, those that speak truth and love and peace and joy. He wants us to be the people that he created us to be. We talked about a ripple effect that such changes will have. A, a ripple effect that will go out through those around us our loved ones, our, our family and friends. Matthew 5 reminds us, you are the salt of the earth as believers, as those that know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. <coughs> but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do they... Put, neither, do, do, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives out light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. <coughs> the plan and purpose for a believer's life is to live a life that's pleasing to our Lord and our Saviour. Uh, live a life that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his followers that they were to be effective in and around their loved ones. If you've been a believer for any length of time, you'll know that the family and your close friends are people who you might find it most difficult to be a believer around, who might be most resistant to sharing with you the joy of your newfound faith. Because just as you were, they're stuck in a position of wanting things to be the same. They don't like change. 
and to find that you're radically newborn, that your life's been turned upside down, is uncomfortable for them. They might make it difficult for you. They might be unpleasant to you. They might be unkind to you. In John's Gospel, we find a lovely account of how a brother's love motivated Andrew, that's Peter's brother, to share with him when he'd come to see the Lord Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, verses 35 to 42. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, Jesus replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas, which when translated is Peter. Andrew's coming and finding that Jesus was the Messiah and listening and spending time with him motivated him first of all to go and tell his, his brother, uh, come and find out. Come and hear what I've heard. Come and be with who I've been with. Uh, and Peter went. Didn't work like that when I tried to witness to my sisters. But it doesn't stop us keeping on, wanting to share, encouraging them to attend, encouraging them to come to events and to be around the people of God. Living the life of truth and grace within our own lives so that others may find it for themselves. Uh, and Peter went on and did a similar thing. Peter's mother-in-law found healing in the Lord Jesus Christ through Peter. Matthew records in chapter 8, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law laying in bed with a fever. He touched her. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. Living for Jesus brings us in contact with loved ones who will be curious Friends in need, strangers inquiring. Our role as believers is to be faithful to Jesus and simply share what we know and live a life of grace. Perhaps where I went wrong all those years ago was perhaps I was too pushy. Perhaps I wanted to give them the answers before they were asking the questions before they had a chance of saying, mm, something's different about you. Perhaps I pushed too hard. Perhaps I wasn't sensitive enough. Sometimes to live out the life of God in us, among our friends and families, is difficult, but necessary. But sometimes, perhaps, living out those lives is where we need to start. We have so much that we want to tell them, so eager for them to come and know the truth. Of course we do. But we had to wait in our own lives until we were ready to receive, till we were asking the right questions, till we were being encouraged. Let's take the opportunities we have to help them to be curious, to help them to be inquirers, Let's live our lives of grace and truth before them. 
and that lovely word grace. It reminds me so much. I'm blessed by not only marrying a, a wonderful wife, but therefore being part of a, a family tradition. A family tradition of the Bible being central to their lives and central to all they did. And my father-in-law sadly passed away before I got all the good things he could tell me out of him. But he had a desire and a love for acrostics. And I remember this one in particular. You see, grace that God gives us is God's riches. All that God has, he gives us. Do we have to pay for it? No, it's at Christ's expense. That little baby born in that stable that we've celebrated, that the world has celebrated in churches and outside of churches, knowingly and unknowingly, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago has been celebrated by people who are giving not another thought until they think about their Christmas presents again next year. But that baby who came and lived among us and suffered and died on that cross, not because of anything he'd ever done wrong, but because of the wrong that I do so easily, moment by moment, day by day, that unfortunately you do. We get all of God's riches through what Christ has done for us, through the payment he's made for us. And then our world changes. Not just our lives need to change, not just a ripple effect to our friends and family, our loved ones, but out into the world as well. I find it amazing and very humbling, I have to say, though perhaps it won't sound so as I share it with you. The number of young men that I taught <coughs> over many years, and taught te teaching in the state system, there was little or no opportunity to witness to anyone while in the classroom. But the number of young men I've seen as they've grown up into later life who've come across me in Portsmouth or somewhere else, have said, I remember you at school. And you think, oh yeah, now I'm in trouble. And now six foot eight and built like brick walls. I knew there was something different about you, but it wasn't until later on. And some of these young men have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. Not through preaching in the classroom, not through an opportunity they've had to spend time with them explaining, but through the grace of God, working in unknown ways through the way that you and I can live our lives. In the new RSV version of the verses that we've written, it says, uh, read this morning, it says this, and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks. And not a few of the leading women, but the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men from, from the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting... These men have turned the world upside down and have come here also. These men have turned the world upside down. <coughs> what are we doing to turn the world upside down? What opportunities do we have? What can we do? 
here's some truths that might help us. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love of the Father, sorry, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it doesn't know him. You see, if as believers we're expecting people to say, wow, Christians, they're a great bunch. I, I just love what they do. Then often we're going to be disappointed. Because that's not the way the world feels about us. We, we talked earlier about a, a spiritual battle that we enter. We've always been in it. We've always been in a spiritual battle, but only as we take that step of faith does that battle heat up for us. Do we become aware of that battle? But the motivation of understanding how great God's love is for us in all that he has done and all that he will do for us should inspire us. We should begin to feel differently